so we're looking at William Wordsworth today. Uh, last class, we left off looking at William Blake, who's the, uh, I guess, of all the so-called big six uh, romantic poets. Uh, Blake is the uh, uh, youngest of them, or the eldest, depending on who you look at. So he, he was born first. William Wordsworth is born in 1770 and dies in 1850, so he lives a good ripe old age, 80 years. Uh, and he is the figure most strongly identified with the English Romantic movement. So Blake, although he writes, um, and he's, he's a contemporary of, of Wordsworth, and Wordsworth did know him, but Blake received nothing like the acclaim that Wordsworth did. Uh, Wordsworth is the figure that is identified with uh, the Romantic movement in England, and uh, he, together with another author, but who we will look at in, uh, in uh, after the reading break, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, wrote a series of poems called Lyrical Ballads, and we're going to look at a couple of them today. <laughs> uh, this collection of poetry appeared first in 1798 the lyrical ballads. And uh, many people see the, this collection of poems as launching the Romantic movement. So last class, we looked at Blake and said that he published Songs of Innocence and Experience in 1789, so nine years before that, in the same year as the French Revolution. And I did talk about the importance of the French Revolution on all of the Romantic poets. Uh, and it also holds for Wordsworth and Coleridge. But this is when Romanticism becomes popular. As I say, Blake was not well acknowledged in his own day. It was for later generations to acknowledge the greatness of his writing, although he was known as an engraver, and we looked at some of the images from that. Um, <clears throat> but this collection of poems, uh, Lyrical Ballads, is uh, is the one that people see as the, as the beginning of Romanticism, at, at least in England. Uh, he's the second of five children, by the way, uh, born in an area of the country now, uh, or called the Lake District. And that's not unimportant for Wordsworth because he and uh, Coleridge are often, and uh, another writer uh, by the name of Charles Lamb, are often called the Lake Poets because they were writing about an area of England up in towards the north of the country, this being Scotland, north of here. Uh, this area over here, Cumbria, uh, there are, so there's a mountain range that runs down the spine of England called the Pennines, and this is called the Lake District often, although technically speaking, this is Cumbria. So there are lakes all around here, and, and, and Wordsworth was born in that area. Now, this, this is significant because Wordsworth is most strongly identified with nature. Uh, nature, uh, like, like Blake, the imagination plays an all-important role in Wordsworth, but so does nature. Uh, the two work together almost hand in glove. Uh, and we're, we're going to see that as a feature of his uh, poetry, the, the strong role of nature, and more specifically, what he attributes to nature, which is a supernatural power. So when Wordsworth talks about nature, he's not merely thinking of what we do when we refer to nature, which is the, you know, the green stuff, the water, the air, but a presence that underlies that or is in within that natural world. So a a later writer will call, uh, by the name of Tom Thomas Carlyle, will call this a natural supernaturalism. And what Wordsworth is doing is addressing the, the disenchantment of the uh, natural world, which had really taken place in the foregoing 150 years or so since the scientific revolution and uh, particularly under the Enlightenment. Um, this idea that um, everything was in some sense 
orientated towards God and all things worked together and had the same sort of um, telos, if you will, to use the Greek word, uh, as a purpose they were directed towards God. That sense of the, the natural world being, uh, as the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies showeth forth the work of his hands. Uh, and day after day they pour forth speech and so forth. And Jesus says, if, the, if you had not declared that I were Lord, the very stones would have cried out. So the sense that nature speaks and testifies to the fact that it has a creator, uh, which Paul also speaks of in, in Romans 1. Right, so that sense that everything has been created by God and it's for God and also for obviously human beings who've been put into the world, but there's a sort of a sense of a natural witness to God's glory in the presence of nature. Wordsworth recovers that and, and so does uh, Coleridge to a lesser degree, but we'll, they come at it from different angles. But um, I'm saying that as a preface to the two poems we're going to look at today, the first one being a poem called We Are Seven, which was from written and published in the Lyrical Ballads. And um, it's very interesting, and I'll, I'll give you something of what Wordsworth recounted in his letters about the genesis of this poem, which is that, um, it, and I'll, I'll quote here, in the spring of the year 1798, Coleridge, my sister, and by the way, his sister is also important in his poetry. She regularly appears, including in Tintern Abbey. Coleridge, my sister, and myself started from Alfoxton pretty late in the afternoon with a view to visit Linton uh, in the Valley of Stones near it. And as our united funds were very small, we agreed to defray the expense of the tour by writing a poem to be sent to the new monthly magazine set up by Phillips, the bookseller, and edited by Dr. Aiken. Accordingly, we set off and proceeded along the Quantic Hill towards Watchet, and in the course of this walk was planned the poem of the Ancient Mariner, which we'll read in a couple weeks by Coleridge. Founded on a dream, as Mr. Coleridge said, of his friend, Mr. Cruikshank, much the greatest part of the story was Mr. Coleridge's invention, but certain parts I myself suggested. For example, some crime was to be committed which should bring upon the old navigator, as Coleridge afterwards delighted to call him, the spectral persecution as a consequence of that crime and his own wanderings. I, Wordsworth, had been reading in Shelvock's Voyages a day or two before that while doubling Cape Horn, that is going around South Africa, they frequently saw albatrosses in that latitude, the largest sort of sea fowl, some extending their wings 12 or 15 part apart. I'll skip over that because it's more related to the ancient mariner. But then he moves on to talk about what he is going to write. Uh, and accordingly, he wrote, uh, and then they decided on the fact that Coleridge was going to write about supernatural things and set them in a natural landscape, whereas Wordsworth was going to talk about natural things and give them a supernatural quality. So he then comes to write this poem, uh, along with The Idiot Boy, Her Eyes Are Wild, etc., this poem, which is We Are Seven. Now, as to We Are Seven, the piece that called forth this note, I composed it while walking in the grove. My friends will not deem it too trifling to relate that while walking, I composed the last stanza first, having begun with the very last line, nay, we are seven. When it was all finished, I came in, recited a Coleridge of my sister, and said, a prefatory stanza must be added, and I should sit down our tea meal with greater pleasure if my task were finished, and then he wrote it. Um, I don't think it's that significant in a sense, but he's talking about how a child understands death, which is a, in Wordsworth's day, um, a more regularly experienced thing than it is in ours. And when I say that, everybody dies in our day just as much as in his. What I mean by that is they will see the people die. When, when we uh, get sick, it's not that we, people never see anyone die, although I've asked my classes before, have you ever seen somebody die? And the answer is usually no. And actually, 
observed it with their own two eyes, other than on TV or something like that, right? They haven't actually seen a family, friend, a member of your family, a loved one, an, a stranger, whatever, die in front of you in a dead body. They've actually not seen it. In Wordsworth's day, it would have been a part of common experience. In part because medicine was not so common, but uh, in larger degree because they didn't have hospitals where the dead would, or the dead, the sick would be uh, sequestered away and uh, taken care of uh, away from the, their loved ones. Uh, so what he's writing about here is the child's experience of death and what the child does in relation to that experience. So I'm going to read the poem and then I'm going to comment on it because the discussion of this in some ways is the fact that uh, the, the adult is uh, responds to it differently than the child. And the child's response is to Wordsworth interesting. And to some degree, uh, he talks about how a child is taught to lie in these poems by adults. Anyway, I'll read it. Note that it begins with a long dash, which is an odd way. It's as if it were an in the, uh, like, why would you begin a poem with a long dash? Like a pause, like de designated by that dash. There's a pause, he breaks into it. But anyway, I'll come back to that in a sec. A simple child that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb, what should it know of death? I met a little cottage girl. She was eight years old, she said. Her hair was thick with many a curl that clustered round her head. She had a rustic woodland air, and she was wildly clad. Her eyes were fair and very fair. Her beauty made me glad. Sisters and brothers, little maid, how many may you be? How many? Seven in all, she said, and wondering looked at me. And where are they? I pray you tell. She answered, Seven are we, and two of us at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother, and in the churchyard cottage I dwell near them with my mother. You say that two at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea, yet ye are seven? I pray you tell, sweet maid, how this may be. Then did the little maid reply, Seven boys and girls are we, two of us in the churchyard lie beneath the churchyard tree. You run about, my little maid, your limbs, they are alive. If two are in the churchyard laid, then ye are only five. Their graves, graves are green, they may be seen, the little maid replied. Twelve steps or more from my mother's door, and they are side by side. My stockings there I often knit, my kerchief there I hem, and there upon the ground I sit and sing a song to them. And often after sunset, sir, when it is light and fair, I take my little porringer, porringer and eat my supper there. The first that died was Sister Jane. In bed she moaning lay till God released her of her pain, and then she went away. So in the churchyard she was laid, and when the grass was dry, together around her grave we played, my brother John and I. And when the ground was white with snow, and I could run and slide, my brother John was forced to go, and he lies by her side. How many are you then, said I, if they two are in heaven? Quick was the little maid's reply. Oh, master, we are seven, but they are dead. Those two are dead. Their spirits are in heaven. Twas throwing words away, for still the little maid would have her will and said, nay, we are seven. So the poem is uh, like Blake's poems. I think you can see there's a simplicity to it in the diction. Uh, and also in the agents that are, or the protagonists in the poem, we have a child. Uh, we have another 
person with whom she's speaking. The context is country life, rural life. Uh, the language is very simple. It's not a difficult poem to understand. You're not searching for, um, you know, have to look up in a dictionary what the word means or anything like that. It's the sort of words you'd use uh, just as, as they would, um, more or less. Um, it's written in rhyme, um, but it's not, it's not uh, rhyming couplets. It's alternating rhymes. So child, uh, and, and the, the first is not even in rhyme, child, breath, limb, death, but breath and death are, whereas thereafter it becomes regular. So girl said, curl, head, air, clad, fair, glad, etc. right? So there's a regularity to it and each uh, stanza is four lines. And it's roughly speaking tetrameter. So it has a regularity to it and a song-like quality, but it's not a song. Nobody sings the lyrical ballads. A ballad's a type of song, but these are not to be sung. But they have that, um, a ballad is, is more of an enchanting type of, uh, uh, of lay. It's a pop popular song. And, and in this case, um, the prefatory uh, paragraph uh, is the comment on what will follow. So again, a simple child that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb, what should it know of death? So he's talking about the fact that children don't understand death. And the reason they don't understand death is because they have not yet experienced it. They don't know how to process it. They can only understand life and the living. So this is from the perspective of what Blake, as we saw in our last class, would call innocence. So the child looks at things through the eyes of innocence. She knows that the, her two brothers, uh, her brother and her sister that are in the grave are not with them anymore, and yet she can't imagine uh, that they're not there in some sense. And so we have the voice of experience speaking to the voice of innocence. And the voice of experience is trying to get the, the child who's innocent to look at things the way he does and is insistent and is observing the logical contradictions in the child's way of looking at things. And the child won't, uh, won't give in, says, no, that's not the way it is. There are seven of us. And the fact that two of my siblings are overseas and two of them are uh, in uh, Conway, which is a nearby town, and two of them are in the grave doesn't change the fact that she has seven brothers and sisters. So she conceives them as living. And the audience that reads this, I think, well, I don't know what the audience will think. They, I think the audience, uh, being probably adults, will understand both sides here. I think. I think the way that the child is portrayed is sympathetic. It's not condescending, it's not derogatory. The adult isn't being seen as right and the child is being illogical, incapable of understanding. There's a sense in which the, the, the child's way of looking at things is correct. And that the child's motivated by familial affection, familial love, if you will, and in that sense, irrespective of whether two are away at another, in another town, two are overseas, and two are in the grave, they're still seven. She sees them all as her family and that never changes. So that, that sense of, uh, of a bond that unites them irrespective of other things, that's the way the child sees them. So fundamentally a unity. And everything is connected to everything else for a child because their, their world is small. Remember what it's like to be a child. You, you, don't, you can't travel very far. Your experiences uh, of other people is relatively limited and that uh, gives you a sense of stability and security and, uh, and the affections of the home grow very strong then. You're very strongly attached to people. So much so in her case that even though she's eight, she can't imagine that her, even her dead 
siblings are not with her in some way. So that's what Wordsworth's emphasizing about the child's experience here. Whereas the adult wants to make categorical distinctions, reasoning like an adult. Well, you say that you're seven, but two are dead, so that makes you five. And if I want to look at it another way, the other four children are not in the house either, so actually there's just you and your mother. That's the reality here. But let's say, but the, but the, point, the, the uh, adult doesn't make a point of that. The adult makes a point about death, about death being the cessation of life. So if two are dead, you're not seven, you're five. And so there's a hard line driven between the dead and the living, and the child doesn't see it that way. And the note that Wordsworth's quite subtle with this, he doesn't moralize, he doesn't tell us what we're to think, but he leads us in some ways in the way he tells us to sympathize with the child. And so we're uh, wanting to acknowledge there's something that the child is stating that is true that the adult is not acknowledging, that's the whole point here. So, and this is characteristic of the Romantic movement in general. The Romantic movement uh, looks at the world in ways that are uncommon, and it, and it partly does so. Sorry, let's get my eraser here. It does so by looking at things from the vantage point of unusual figures as far as poetic diction is. So the hero, in this case, is an eight-year-old girl. It's not an aristocrat. It's not a prince. It's a eight-year-old girl living out in the countryside. Unusual. Uh, when I say unusual, unusual at this time. After the Romantics, children are regularly the heroes of fiction. Regularly. In fact, um, I've said this in numerous situations, in numerous contexts, the uh, typical hero of uh, Western literature after the Romantic period is an orphaned child. I'll say more about that, but if you look at the work of Charles Dickens, the heroes are, tend to be children and they tend to be orphaned. Um, same with uh, Anne of Green Gables, it, Lucy Maud Montgomery, Montgomery, right? Uh, same thing to some degree is even true of uh, C.S. Lewis's Narnia Chronicles. But the James Bond uh, movies, he's, he's an orphan. Uh, so are all the superhero heroes. They're orphans. So for that matter is Harry Potter. And you can, you, the, the list could go on. There, it's almost, it's harder to find somebody who isn't orphaned <laughs> and a child hero than it is to find somebody that is, like by far. It's very hard to find somebody who isn't. Same with all the Disney movies. They, in, they involve almost invariably an orphaned child who is the character that we're drawn to sympathizing with. So it's a very different uh, in, in scriptural understanding to be an orphan is to be in a pitiable state. And adults need to look after the orphans and the Christians open orphanages in part because of this, right? And adopt um, children into their own families and so forth, which was not the practice in the, uh, the ancient world, to put it mildly. Um, but in the Romantic movement, uh, it's a different tack. They don't look after them as beings that need looking after. They look at them as heroes to be looked up to. And that has a profound effect on Western culture. So this is my, uh, not commenting on the poem, but copying on the development of the whole Romantic movement now. Uh, it, once you start making an orphan into your hero, it, it affects your view of what education is as well. Because if the orphan is the hero, then that's your role model, in which case you don't need to learn from adults. A, an orphan has no adults to learn from. You don't learn from authorities, whether it's the church or your culture or whatever. You learn from your own experiences. You learn by looking within yourself. Whether you're Harry Potter and you Dumbledore tells him to look within himself because Dumbledore can't advise him, the wise old wizard. He can't tell Harry Potter what to think or what to do. Harry will have to figure it out for himself. 
because of his special nature. That's a common romantic trope. The child looks within and within himself finds the guidance. Same thing is said to Spider-Man. You will know, your spidey sense, whatever. There's a sense that the, the uh, hero is, uh, can't appeal to an authority for guidance. The wisdom of the ancients, irrelevant. So in some sense, the Romantic movement is a continuation of what we saw in the Enlightenment, which was uh, predicated on the rule of reason, but also distrusting what other people said. The uh, motto of the Enlightenment, or of the Royal Society, is, this is the Latin, nullius in verba, rough translation, a very bad one, trust no one's words investigate, right? Trial and error. You do a scientific method, you establish things on, with your own two eyes. It's not like doubting Thomas. It's, it's a method of establishing truth with your own two eyes. You don't trust what the teachers say, don't trust what your parents say, don't trust what the church says, don't trust what <coughs> historical wisdom says, you trust yourself. And so it's rooted in the Enlightenment's postulate of autonomy. Which literally is the law of the self. Auto is the self. Automobile is a self-propelling vehicle. Uh, nomos, the Greek for law. Your law unto yourself. <coughs> So that has profound influence. So the, in this encounter, we do, in a sense, see it from both sides, but this is already revolutionary. The adult is not the voice of authority here. To some degree, it's the child. We're drawn to sympathy with the child. That's a consistent pattern in Wordsworth. Now let me look at the next poem that I want to illustrate that with, and it's in a very different way, and a very different type of poem as well. Comments or questions about this? How do you like the poem? I like it. I think it's well done. I think it is quite evocative and it's quite uh, powerful. <coughs> can I get somebody to turn the light off here so we can see the screen? Thank you. Sorry for, should have said that earlier. Because <coughs> this next poem is called, and it's quite the mouthful, it's called Lines composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey, Abbey on revisiting the banks of the Wye during a tour, July 13th, 1798. Okay, so that's quite the mouthful for a title. Very common in the 18th century. It's a loco descriptive title. It would work well on library word searches in our day. Uh, it's not a snappy, memorable title. Uh, because of that, it tends to be known by a different title, and the title is just Tintern Abbey. It's called Tintern Abbey. But if you see, this is a, the actual title is that lengthy one that you've got there, and it even tells you when it happened, when it happened, and where, and uh, at what time, and all of this. So this poem is about this place. Now, this is a picture of Tintern Abbey. Uh, I'll put another one up there as well. It's not the best picture. And uh, here's another one from across the river Y, and here's a third one. This is from inside the abbey. What do you notice about the abbey? This is from our day, but it would have looked the same in Wordsworth's day. What do you notice about the abbey? What is an abbey, first of all? It's where monks gather. The abbot would run it. It's a it's a it's a a church building. It's a monastic community run by an abbot. Abbot, and so it's called an abbey. These abbeys are scattered all around England. Most of them were uh, so they're Catholic orders. They would have gone back to the Middle Ages. And when Henry VIII proclaimed himself to be the head of the Church of England, he uh, seized the properties and throughout the monks. It says that those properties don't belong to the Roman Catholic Church, they belong to the Church of England. And many of them went defunct, basically, and so they became ruins. 
and this is one of them. So this is an abbey, and, and clearly a, a church of some, uh, or a sacred building of some sort, and yet it's also a ruin. Now, so this is important. And the reason it's important is because, uh, and I need to give you a little context here, ruins uh, were evocative of something in the 18th century that was highly valued as part of an experience that they called the sublime. Wordsworth will use this word sublime in this, this very poem, but the whole poem is about the sublime. Now, what does the sublime have to do with a ruin? <clears throat> because you will see in the Gothic novels of the pe this period, and the most famous of them being Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but there are, it's a, a widely popu wildly popular genre in uh, this day and age. Um, the setting is often in the Middle Ages with monks and nuns, and usually there's a, some sort of a murder or some sort of scandal attached with it. Um, but the landscape is sort of uh, set in the past, in a past that's obscure, and in a past that's terrifying in some way. So again, the Gothic horror novel arises out of this. Uh, Jane Austen speaks of it in her novels as well. So Northanger Abbey is a sort of a take on the, the Gothic horror novel, uh, if you ever come to read that. but. Um, but the sublime experience is the experience of a power greater than you. And when I say greater, infinitely greater. Not just an a adult encountering a child, it's the power of the adult comparatively, but a power that suggests the enormity of, of God. So a typical lands, uh, sublime landscape might be uh, a view of the ocean so if, and, or one of our Great Lakes. So if you go to Lake Ontario and you stand on the, on the beach there and you look out, you look out, you don't see anything. Like it's lake and there's nothing that breaks up the eye. It just, you look into the distance and it seems like it goes on forever. I said last time when we looked at uh, the Palace of Versailles, it was creating a sort of a sublime experience there by setting itself above the earth. I said, you stood, if you stand in Versailles in the Hall of Mirrors and you look out through one of the windows, you don't see anything. It looks like you're looking into the sky. So it looks like you're set up in the heavens. It's a sublime view. Uh, in the 18th century, the sublime was associated with great mountains. So the largest mountain in Europe uh, in the Alps is Mont Blanc before it became famous as a pen. The largest mountain in the Alps, Mont Blanc, it goes up so high that its peak gets lost in the clouds. You can't see the top because of the clouds. So, and it's a sense, if you've ever been in the presence of a giant mountain beside it, you have a sense of the enormity, of not just of the mountain, but the smallness of yourself, more than that, that, that sense of awe, the natural awe, that is associated with the, the sublime. Now, why is that with the ruin? Because this doesn't suggest the same thing, not so quite so immediately. You don't, you don't have that feeling of awesome presence. But what it suggests is, uh, uh, this one requires a little bit more thought to get the sense of the sublime. What you look at here is a magnificent building that was built centuries ago, many centuries ago, and it has lasted the test of time. It still stands, and yet it has been eroded by nature. Wind, rain, it slowly eroded it away. So now what we have left is a ruin. It's a, it has a vestige of its past greatness, and yet there's something greater than even the work, the work of civilized mankind, and that's the power of nature to destroy it. And that's evident in looking at this ruin. So it's not what you see that evokes the sublime here. It's what you imagine. That's the point. You imagine what must have happened for what once would have been a building that you could walk into and was being used as a, an abbot and now is only left as a shell of what it once was in which there's no roof on it, and which there's green 
There's no carpeting or, or floor. There's grass growing up in it. So that's what he's writing about. And note that he composes it a few miles above Tintern Abbey. That's when he composes it. So he's seen the abbey and now he's away from the abbey when he writes that. So this is also important. But here's how the poem begins. I'll, I'll, I'll read this. But uh, note that uh, nature has various connotations here. Um, and I want to note three types of nature that Wordsworth will use in this poem. Firstly, there's just the external nature. So uh, the grass here and the trees in the background. So this is the sort of nat nature of the Y Valley. This is the landscape around it. So it's present in nature. And look, even the roof here, such as there is, is covered by green. Like it's gr grown moss growing on the roof and so forth. So there's that sense of nature. Secondly, there's all existence is being described as nature like everything, including the building itself and including the person looking at it. It's all nature. And thirdly, uh, a sort of a something that is in nature that's not visible. And it's everywhere. So those three things, but the third one is the most important one, the one that marks Wordsworth's poem, and that's what gives it its power, is what I will, will call his panentheism. I'm going to write it separately here, even though it's actually one word. Panentheism. Pan means all, in, a theism in all. Do it accurate. There's a, there's a sense of God in everything. It's not pantheism. Pantheism is everything is God. Everything is God. That's not what he's saying. But he is saying that there is a God in everything. That's what he's going to describe. Or again, in a different way, the, super, the natural supernaturalism. So those three senses of nature. There's the, the green here, that sense of nature. Nature as a, an all-inclusive term. And then finally, the sense that there's a God in it. That sense of nature. And that it's the third sense that is the one that he is bringing out through his telling of this. Now, let me read the beginning of it, and then I will pause and come back and comment, but I'm gonna read the first 22 lines of this. And I want you to note that he is remembering, and the memory is very important for Wordsworth. If you go back to what we saw in We Are Seven, there was no sense of memory there. The, the child could not there was only a present sense. They didn't have a sense of loss. The, the, her two brother, her brother and sister were in the ground that sh they were still present to her. The adult had a sense of time. Well, they're no longer with us, right? The sense of temporality had crept in. For the child to experience something immediately and also to remember it were basically the same. And yet got a sense of consecutive time and, and death and what that meant mortality had not really come clear. But Wordsworth is, now he's writing this as an adult and thinking back to a time when he was there earlier. And then he's going to go back to his current reflection. So there's a little backtracking going on. So I will now read it. So five years have passed. Five summers with the length of five long winters. And again I hear these waters rolling their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day is come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid groves and copses. Once again, I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, uh, sorry, uh, little lines of sportive wood run wild, these pastoral farms green to the very door and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. 
with some uncertain notice, as might seem, of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods, or of some hermit's cave where by his fire the hermit sits alone. Let me pause for a second. I want to ask you a question, and it's not a question that I'm... What's your impression of, this, of the scene described as I've just read it? I'm talking about your feelings about it now. What, what struck you? What made you, what jumped out at you, if anything? Or what was the overall impression? Perhaps that's even a better question. What's the overall impression of those 22 lines that I just read? No wrong answer. Peaceful, yes, totally. Impossible to deny. There's a sense of peace that falls over the whole scene. What else? And we'll look at why that is in a minute because it's undeniable. What else? How about attentiveness, like listening? There's a sense of you're almost leaning in to things. I mean, But let's go, let's go to the peacefulness first of all. First of all, uh, notice that he again uses this long dash in line five. He'll use it again later in the poem in the next stanza. But he throws that in there right away. But as far as the peacefulness, he hears, he hears. There's a lot of emphasis on hearing. There's also an emphasis on seeing. But he goes beyond both hearing and seeing. I'm gonna, and they start to blur and blend into each other even. So look. So I hear these waters rolling down from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. And if you've been near a, a hill of any sort where water is running, you, you imagine that quiet noise, right? It's not, it's not even a noise. It's sa noise sounds noisy. This is a soft and it's a murmur. You think of somebody speaking, and the word murmur is onomatopoetic. Like murmur. Mm -hmm. it's like, so it's a very soft humming, almost, and it's rolling down. And once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild seclude scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. Okay, he's drawing your attention to the sky. And not the sight of the sky, but the sound of the sky. What sound does, do skies make? Does the sky make any noise? If it has a plane in it, it might. If it has birds in it, it might. But he's just talking about the sky. The sky doesn't make any noise. But he's drawing your attention to something that you don't pay attention to. Because there's nothing to pay attention to. There's no audible sound. So you don't observe that it doesn't make any sound. Well, of course it doesn't because it does, except when he draws your attention to it, he's asking you to attend to things that are below your normal, empirical, uh, sensory observations. And he does the, this consistently. So it connects the landscape with the quiet of the sky. Well, what is it connected with? A wild secluded scene which impresses thoughts of more deep seclusion. So there's a secluded scene, like there's nobody around here, like he, it's just him. There were once many people inside this abbey, and now there's nobody, it's just him and the, uh, and so he thinks about how lonely it is. Why? Because there used to be people here, and now there's no one. So he feels secluded, and the thoughts of the seclusion make him think about his own seclusion, the thoughts of seclusion, and that's even more secluded. So there's a sense of isolation and quietness, and so it leads to a sort of introspection, a mood, if you will. And he says that as he looks at this, he sees the green, and it's green, and everything's in one green clue, and everything loses itself. It starts to blend into one. And we get the experience of what we could call synesthesia, where you're, you start to 
hear things that you should see and see things that you should hear and so forth, and they blend into one another. And that's because it, it's perceiving the God in everything. It's drawing your attention behind the scenes almost. So furthermore, once again, I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows. A hedgerow is something that somebody constructs as an obstacle to keep uh, the sheep in or something on this side of the hedge or to keep people out. But these aren't hedgerows. They're little lines of sport of wood run wild. So there's a wild saying, these pastoral farms green to the very door. It's a pastoral farm, but there's no farmer. And they're green. So the nature, the naturalness of nature coming, and it's all the way up to the door and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. Now, what sound does smoke make? About the same sound as the sky makes. It's, it makes no noise. Smoke never makes noise. What causes the smoke could make noise. If you heard a crackling fire, you saw the smoke. Okay, the fire makes the noise, but the smoke is a sign of the fire, but it makes no noise. He's drawing your attention to the, the silence of that. Now, when he's paying attention to the sound, it's the sound of no sound. Finally, he concludes, and they're sent up in silence from among the trees, and then finally he draws your attention to who might be in these woods, these secluded woods, of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods. So somebody living here in a place where there is no house. A hermit, perhaps. A hermit's cave, whereby his fire the hermit sits alone. Well, this is called redundancy. What's the definition of a hermit? Somebody who lives alone. So if the hermit is sitting alone, well, of course he does. He's a hermit. You don't need to say it. This is redundant. This use of redundancy pervades the first 22 lines. To, to say that the sky is quiet is a redundant phrase. Make, of course it's quiet. Doesn't, to say that the smoke goes up in silence, this is redundant. It's smoke that is category mistake. To say that the hermit sits alone is to say he's being a hermit. But the effect of all of these things is to get you to pay attention to silence, seclusion, loneliness in order to, to get you to meditate on those things. That's the effect of this. Now note that it begins with five years have passed. So it's a five year period. But then he says something very particular about those five years. There are, fi there are five summers, but with the length of five long winters. So it's five years, but they've, it's been a long time. And we associate winter with hard times and we associate summer with good times. It's easy. You don't have to wear the clothes. It's, it's easier to go outside. It's easier to live. You can eat. You know, food provi is provided by the, by the natural landscape, whereas in the winter you have to eat the stores that you've worked hard to uh, harvest over the course of the year. You live indoors, etc. It's harder. So that when he says that the five years have seemed or passed with the length of five long winters, these have been five long years which is a, an, a way of thinking like a child. It's experientially true. But strictly speaking, it's five times 365. So from the adult's vantage, what does that mean? What, it's nonsense. Yeah, five years have passed. Why do you have to put the other stuff in? Well, because the, the poetic telling of it conveys a different sense. And that's the point of the whole introductory stanza there. You see it? Okay, with that, where does he go with this? Second stanza. Now he reflects. These beauteous forms, now he uses the word forms, and forms, whenever a poet uses the word forms, he's almost always evoking the idea of Plato and the forms, the, the ideas, the realm of ideas, the Platonic forms, the idea, an ideal landscape, and that's surely what he is evoking here. These beauteous forms, what forms? The forms that you can't see or hear. A sense of a utopian, an ideal place. That's what he's talking about. These beauteous forms, 
through a long absence, have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye, but oft in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them in hours of weariness sensations sweet, felt in the blood and felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration. Long dash. Feelings too of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Nor less I trust to them I may abode another gift of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the burthen of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, that serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. While with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. Let me stop there, but that's the end of the stanza. What I want you to note there is he makes a, uh, he draws a parallel between what he experienced in that first stanza, namely the sense of the importance of the quietness that he can't actually sense and yet he talks about, like of the sky, of the smoke, of the seclusion, all of that. He draws a, a comparison between that and the best part of a good man's life, which are the little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Things that other people don't notice, but God does. Those things that you did in secret and your heavenly father sees them. That's her, now he doesn't evoke that explicitly, but he's clearly following that same analogy. That's the best part of a person's life. The things that nobody acknowledges as good. You don't get a pat on the head for it. Those things and those things have sustained him in the presence of a very different landscape. The different landscape is that of the city, which is a noisy place. He, he says, and note that it's in lonely rooms, but these lonely rooms don't lead him to think about the city. They lead him to remember this place in nature and the God in nature in everything, which he connects with his own Christian acts, which were never seen or acknowledged by anyone else. Now those, and he's connecting a, almost a spiritual power in nature that Christians would have associated with God. The natural world has pushed him and his experience of nature has brought him to this, and he says he felt it in his blood and felt it along the heart and passing even to, into my purer mind. This is a comparative. Not a pure mind, but a purer mind. What does that even mean? It almost sounds like Eastern philosophy. Like you're moving towards a, a, a blessed state of contemplation into uh, the state of nirvana or something like that. Right? Or a Buddhist reflection. The Buddha whose eyes looks out, he's smiling, but his eyes are turned inwards. They flipped around, right? So the eye, he doesn't have pupils. He's got, you see the backs of the eyes because the eyes are facing inwards. He's looking, or he's navel gazing or whatever. That idea of looking internally and being at peace with that. W Wordsworth is leaning towards Eastern uh, philosophy slash religion here and his description of nature and its effect upon him. And at the same time, he's associating it with acts of charity, which is a very Christian and secret acts of charity and, and of unremembered love, etc., which is very, again, Christian con uh, conception, not uh, an Eastern one. But anyway, he goes on, he said, and these will bring us into a, another gift. And it's a gift, it's something that's given to him. 
and of aspect more sublime, even more sublime. Remember, this was a sublime landscape. It suggested a power that is of nature, that is of God, that was bringing this to ruin. And yet you couldn't see it. But it was plainly evident from what had happened as an effect. And here it, it leads him to a different but analogous and parallel experience. It leads him to a, a type of mood in which the burden of the mystery, what's the mystery? Well, he clarifies, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened. Unintelligible is lifted. Lightened means lifted. And it's a mood that he's, and it, it sees through things. It doesn't, it's not stuck in space and time. There's a sense of timelessness. And it leads to something which uh, directly is drawn from scripture, which is the creation of a new being. So the line in uh, line two, or rather 45, when we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul, that's a reference to the creation of Eve out of Adam's side. Uh, God puts Adam into a deep sleep and from his side draws out Eve and she becomes a living soul, right? And then God breathes into that. But that, that account, it's, it's presented elsewhere as well uh, when God is, um, so there's a creation of a new being. He could also have in mind when Abraham is put into a deep sleep and then he gets some sort of a, uh, an image of a, of a torch passing between the parts of the animals. Or when Daniel falls in Daniel 7 and he falls in, again, this phrase, deep sleep. And God gives him a great vision about what will come. But I think it, here it's more about the creation of a living soul. Now, this is an account of God in Genesis 2, and I think it's 2.24 but it could be 215. Not, at any rate, um, when God creates a being, it's literally a new creation. Adam was there. Now we have Adam and Eve. And Eve is a separate being and has been given life. So there's a new birth. Wordsworth is talking in terms analogous to uh, Christianity. When you were talking about a new birth, we're talking about the old person dying and the new person rising to life, right? The old Adam, the new Adam, the, you put on Christ. You know what I'm talking about? The new birth, the spiritual, when we come to faith in Christ, it's because God pours out his spirit upon us and we confess that Christ is Lord. He gives us a new nature. Paul calls it a new creation. Uh, that's what Wordsworth's talking about, but now it's related to a mood. It's a mindset which I think you have to see correspondence with, with, a, with uh, a Christian understanding of uh, coming to faith. And with that living soul, and with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. So this is not something that he experienced when he was looking at Tim Turn Abbey. It's something that he experienced many years later. So here was when he was innocent, when he first saw it. Now with experience, he reflects back on what it was like and he thinks about it differently. And he thinks about the things that he couldn't see and yet have stayed with him. The quietness of the scene. The sense that there was something that he couldn't put his finger on and yet stayed with him. And he says that thing has brought about a new way of looking at the world and that he draws an analogy with a new birth and it allows him to see the world differently as a prophetic capacity and he says we see an into the life of things now uh, let me carry on if this be but a vain belief yet oh how oft in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart how oft in spirit have i turned to thee o sylvan why the river 
and not just the river, but everything surrounding the river. How often have I thought back to that experience in all of those situations? Thou wanderer through the woods. So now he's personifying the river. How often has my spirit turned to thee? Now, I say he personifies, he also divinizes. He speaks to the river in intimate terms. The thou and the thee are terms that you speak in terms of to somebody that is up in, in intimate relations with you, a member of your own family. The polite form in English is you. It's the one we always use now. I speak to you. I don't speak to, to thee or thou, right? Or I don't use ye either, which is the plural form of that. I speak to you. And that's the polite form. We, we've got rid of the familiar, but when he's using the familiar form, and that is the term that God himself in scripture invites us to. It's a form of intimacy. Not of distance, not of politeness, but of intimate acquaintance. And he speaks of the river that way. This is the river is part of who he is. And it's not the river, it's what was in that whole scene. It's made up him to be the man that he is. Now, let me carry on. And now, with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions, dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. While here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in the moment there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope, though changed, no doubt from what I was, when first I among these hills, above the valley Y, when like a row, that is a deer, I bounded o'er the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature, then, the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by, to me was all in all. So nature, that in the sense of the totality of everything. That's when he was young. Nature was an all. It was everything. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. Remember, he grew up in the Lake District, running around outside in the woods. He had no company. There's very few people living in the Lake District. He was used to being solitary and thinking. Sound and cataract haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms, were then to me an appetite, a feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied, nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. That's what he was. He doesn't even know what it was. It was an unreflective nature. It was a time of innocence, as Blake's just described it. That's what he was back then. Long dash. That time is past. And all its aching joys are now no more. And all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint I, nor mourn, nor murmur. Other gifts have followed. For such loss, I would believe abundant recompense. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor, gra nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. So let me stop there. 
So he makes the comparison. Here's how he was, unreflective, passionate, driven by his appetites, his feelings. In um, the understanding of human nature that Wordsworth would have operated with, uh, the human being has three faculties. We've got passions or appetites. We have a will, and then we have our reasoning. The child did not reason about anything. The child felt things, experienced things, was drawn by them. And to some degree, he says that he was even driven by nature rather than drawn to it. He was scared of things. He'd run from thing to thing. He wouldn't run to it out of a desire for it, but a desire to flee it even. So he talks about that in his uh, uh, great epic, The Prelude, in which he talks about these experiences of, of terror changing his life. Uh, I'll skip over that here. But that's how he used to be. But now, that time is past, line 83, and there's something else that has taken its place. And what is that? The way he looks upon it as an adult. And he doesn't look at it through the eyes of reason. He looks at it through the eyes of imagination. And with his imagination, he remembers what was so invisible there, and yet so pre that presence he felt in the past now informs who he is. And it has led him, in these famous lines, hearing oftentimes the still, sad music of humanity. Note that it's still. It's, there's a quietness, and yet there's a sense of loss. And, it, and, yet, and it's, it's not harsh. It's not grating, but it has ample power to chasten and subdue. So it's almost like a, a corrective moral teacher. And I felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts. So he's not distressed at this. He is overwhelmed with joy inexpressible. Again, it's, it's akin to a Christian experience of the presence of God and awareness of a being that transcends his and yet is intimate with him. Now note in this, uh, well, I'll comment on this afterwards, I guess, or maybe I won't even get to it, but there's no sort of, there's no repentance here. There's no fall. He hasn't done anything that's brought about uh, a transgression that he needs to repent. There's just a sense of, he moved from innocence to experience, and the, the loss is the loss of innocence, but it's not perceived as a moral loss. It's a more just, it happens as you grow older. And I look at things differently. And the only sin, per se, is looking at the things the way adults do without sensing the presence and the things that unite everything. That's the only sin, is to uh, ignore the unity of all things and the inclusion of all things in the oneness that comes from seeing God in all. So today's policies on inclusion and diversity and so forth are of the same spirit. It's coming from that same romantic sense of, of uh, an essential sameness of all things and a unity in them. Anyway. But, he's, but where is this presence? It's a sense sublime. Now, let, I talked about the sublime as an experience. Let me break this word sublime down as well. Um, because strictly speaking, the sublime, if you take the Latin word literally, it's below, like a submarine, a sub lime, a limit. It's below the threshold of perception. Right, something you can't perceive it because it's, it, it's, it's inaudible. Like you think about uh, an illustration of this might be a, a dog whistle. The dog can hear it, we can't. So it's below the threshold of our perception. In that sense, it's subliminal. But he means something more by it. What's subliminal here is a bandwidth of, of sound that suggests the real thing to see there, which you can't see with your eyes, but you have to see with your heart. And this sense sublime is far more deeply interfused 
And where is its dwelling? In the light of setting suns, in the round ocean, the living air, the blue sky, and in the mind of man. In other words, it's everywhere. That presence, his connection, his unity with everything. He says it's a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things and, although he doesn't say and, I'm saying and, all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. So it's a sense of the godness of everything that's in everything. Now this is in some ways glorious and it's powerful and I think it's, it's in some ways words with Beth's poem uh, and it, at conveying what's most Wordsworthian about Wordsworth. That's what I think about this poem. This is a grand poem. It's the beginning of, uh, it's the first poem in the Lyrical Ballads, by the way. It's a fantastic poem. What it does do, though, uh, along with this sense of giving a supernatural sense of nature, is it does something towards to human na nature as well. And this is where I want to conclude with this. With the and that is it, it removes the sense of the special nature of human nature as opposed to the other objects of nature. It reduces them all to one. <coughs> it gives us the same spiritual status to the river and to the trees and to the air as it does to the man beholding them. So he tries to recapture a sense of the enchantment of the, go back to what I said at the beginning, the enchantment of everything because God has created it and he, he does that marvelously well. Better than any other poet, I think. He really does that. But he does it at the expense of the fact that human beings are different than these other things. And so the panentheism here replaces personhood, human personhood, which is a, co a consequence of the fact that we bear the imago Dei of divine personhood. Remember, God is three beings in one, three persons, one nature. That sense of the special feature of Humanity is lost in his all-inclusive spirituality. And so he's recovering the enchantment, but really is what he's doing is making the whole of nature into a sort of a magical thing. And removing the sort of the moral nature of human nature as well. That's, that's he, he sort of, it, it's not that he totally disavows it. He suggests it in many of his poems. There is a moral nature to human nature. But he doesn't really, he's not very clear on how human nature is different than the rest of nature because he so much wants to talk about the supernatural power and the enchantment of the cosmos, which has been lost by the Enlightenment and its materialism and its rationalism, rationalism and so forth. Uh, comments or questions there? He, he concludes with a uh, turning to his sister to share this with her, his dear sister uh, Dorothy, but I'll skip over that. But he then, with, with this experience, he then goes and tells another person, and she shares that sense with him as well. But I'll just leave that off um, because I don't think it contributes to the um, whole thrust of the poem here. And I don't have time, more to the point, because I did We Are Seven. But your thoughts on that? So it's a sense, now think about words or about Plato. Plato has the world of the particulars and the world of the forms. The forms are the ideal. They're the world of the good, the beautiful, the true, the just, etc. We ought to operate in this particular word in world in accordance with that. Wordsworth's sense of the forms is not that it is a realm above and outside. It's rather that it's the, the forms are within nature. And he, so that distinguishes it. And, and then secondly, he seems to see no distinctiveness to human nature or accountability to God for that matter. And again, 
the heroes are in, invariably orphans, poets, vagrants, or criminals. Sometimes a mad mother, somebody who's lost, but somebody who's an outsider, socially odd. Next time I'll come to um, some of his other poems. I think we'll look at uh, his Immortality Ode, Ode on the Intimations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood. That will build on what we did this time, and we'll look at some, I think, his prelude or uh, preface to the recluse and so forth as well. But I'll, I'll see you then, okay?